Welcome to your global enhancement platform for higher education quality assurance. My name is Susanna Karahanyan, and I'm the president of INGWAHI, International Network of Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education. And um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar on COVID-19 theme. This is one of the webinars that INGWAHI is organizing under the theme. And the theme, the global theme for this is access to success challenges in higher education amid COVID and beyond, and how the institutions actually uh, manage this um, situation, how the government uh, manages the situation, and uh, what is the role of the QA in mitigating the risks. Um, well, uh, I would like to introduce uh, briefly Inkwahi. Inkwahi is the global platform for quality insurance providers, internal and external quality providers, and we are uh, here uh, basically with the mission of enhancement, quality assurance in general, improvement, and also we are uh, dealing with um, uh, research and uh, knowledge development and knowledge transfer. So we, um, we are an organization of uh, 300 plus quality assurance providers. And one of major values that we have, one of the major benefits we have is that we are bridging, bridging the diversity of cultures, bringing the beauty of all the cultures and all the systems in one platform and share it globally with everybody for, your, for the benefit of our members and beyond. We are happy to offer this incredible opportunity for you to get together now and discuss the issues that are critical for all of us as higher education community we, uh, since we are facing um, the challenges currently uh, amid the pandemic. In the challenging times of COVID, Inguahi has taken extra measures to ensure that we are next to our members and support them in any way possible. Among our recent contributions is the guidelines for quality assurance providers we have published. We have, um, we have a series of webinars we're offering to address the hot issues, and this is one of them. And another one is to be expected on the 14th of July, next week. Then we also have established a COVID-19 hub uh, where we share, well, this is a socialization platform for all quality insurance providers to get together to share their views, their experiences, and also share the best practices they have and how they basically ch face the challenges that they are facing in a diversity of contexts and cultures. Before I move on to the content of the current webinar, I would like to thank DEAC and especially Liam, Matthew and Rob for the technical support, all the great job they have done to host this webinar and um, uh, uh, all the efforts that they have made to make this beautiful event happen. So uh, a couple of technical issues uh, to uh, run this um, webinar. Um, there is a chat box and please, if you wanna share your ideas and chat, please chat in the chat box. But if you have specific questions you want the panelists to address, please draft them, uh, put them into the Q&A section, because this is where I will be looking at uh, to uh, coach all the uh, questions that you are uh, sending to us and share with the panel. Hope this is something that um, everybody else uh, is already used to and we will be easily moving forward. So in terms of the um, theme of this webinar, what was the major driving force for us to come up with this? The, the driving force behind this theme was access basically and the governance of higher education. How do we handle these um, issues? Um, uh, how does the government and the higher education um, institutions handle the issues related to the COVID-19 and uh, especially when it comes to the access of education. As per World Bank, we know that about 60% of, um, it's only 60% of uh, students that had access during the online provision, which means that the online provision is not the best of the modes to ensure that the access to higher education is not challenged. And over the night, we all were locked, the, glo the global lockdown happened and the students, 40% of, approximately 40% of students were left out. So uh, the sub things that we're addressing now would be around how applicants and existing students fail with online education. What are the major risks to students? Who are they? And what is the potential support that the government and the institutions are providing? 
how different governments respond to this. We have a beautiful mix of international expertise on the panel, and we'll be sharing the different practices coming from different parts of the world. Further, we will be discussing the new governance model in the times of pandemic and online provision, policy changes, fast tracking in the potential impact given the lack of appropriate data for informed decision making, implications of COVID on financial management, and last but not least, we will be covering the issues about the, what are the expectations from the quality assurance, flexibility, adaptation of QA criteria to online education, new assessment methods. So uh, predominantly, when uh, all the webinars we have been uh, delivering and I have been part of, they all raise the issue of access. Should the quality assurance bodies review all their criteria to make sure that the access is the core? because this is how we can make sure that the students are not suffering. With this brief introduction and without any further ado, I would like to introduce to the most um, uh, global panel of experts, <laughs> leading globally leading experts in higher education, whose contribution aspires to make this event an unforgettable and very useful one. Um, uh, the panel is um, uh, headed by, um, I mean, uh, you will see in the panel Dr. Jamil Salmi, Dr. Paul Gaston, and Neve O'Reilly. And I am not going to, to present them, I will go, I will give them the floor to, the, to do so for themselves. So Jamil, the floor is yours for a brief presentation to your expertise. Thank you very much, Susanna, for this invitation to participate in this important inquiry webinar. And uh, I will just introduce myself as a student of higher education globally. And without further ado, I will uh, try to share my presentation. Can you all see it? I think we're good. So I would like yeah. to start by taking us back eight years into the past when Professor Hensi, the president of Stanford University, gave a speech talking about the tsunami that is coming to higher education. And he was referring to universities in the digital era. And I'm afraid not many people paid any attention to his warning. And yet, eight years later, it took only a very tiny virus to tell us that the digital era had indeed arrived. I hope many of the participants are like me, Beatles fan. And uh, ever since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been thinking about a quote from John Lennon, who used to say that life is what actually happens to you while you are busy making plans. I don't know about other people, but it's the first time in 34 years that I'm stuck at the same place without traveling for many months. But the immediate consequences of the pandemic have been terrible for many of us. Very rapidly, a number of students, faculty members and administrators over in several countries, several universities were contaminated and some of them have died. Universities almost overnight have closed down in almost all countries from one day to the other. No more classes, no more research, no more exams. And it's become a tragedy for many students, and I come back to that, who from one day to the other lost sometimes their income, their place to live. No more international mobility and conferences. And already I can see that in several countries, universities have started to dismiss some of their professors and administrators. So to summarize with you what has been happening in the past three months, divided my presentation into three parts. I want to go quickly and see whether there is anything we can learn from the past and then look at how universities have been adapting to the present situation and finally 
focus on what's the best way to prepare for the future. I want to take you back to 1665-66. Historians will know that this was the last episode of the pest in England for several months. The main preoccupation was to find a place to bury the dead, 75,000. Many of them were put in collective, in mass graves. So back then something happened that is happening today. University of Cambridge, for example, had to close down. But it didn't prevent one of its illustrious students, Isaac Newton, from studying at home, continuing his studies and being very efficient since during that period he invented calculus and discovered the laws of motion. Closer to us, 2002 and 2003, was the SARS epidemic. We started in China and moved almost all over the world, reaching 29 countries in Asia, Europe, North and South America. Now, when we look at the numbers, 8,096 people contaminated and 774 dead, which is tragic for those involved, but compared to what we are experiencing today, it seems like a small drop in the bucket. Now, back then, in the territories that were most affected, namely China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, schools and universities had to shut down. And some of them, switched to online education for the first time for a few months and then back to normal. Not everywhere though. A friend of mine was hired as a professor by University of Singapore 10 years ago, I'm talking 2010. And he told me that his experience was a little bit unusual because besides giving him a access card to the buildings and the keys to his office, they also gave him a thermometer, just in case a virus would come. I'm talking 2010, 10 years ago. But most importantly, he was compelled to take a training several weeks to learn to teach online. So what did we learn from these examples? That already there were instances where online education was used to compensate effectively when the university closed down. But the truth is that very few universities have really prepared for the next epidemic or any other type of catastrophe. And yet we knew that it was coming. On April 3rd, 2015, five years ago, Bill Gates gave a fair famous TED talk, and we're providing you with the link in the chat box if you're interested. It's fascinating. And he goes on telling us about his experience as a child growing up in America in the middle of the Cold War. He said that they had a big barrel in the, uh, the, down, in the downstairs in the house where they were holding food supplies in case of the atomic bomb. But he said, forget about the atomic bomb. The main danger for mankind, again, I remind you, he spoke five years ago, is the next pandemic. And we, were, we can wonder what, where, where the political leaders and the health specialists to prepare ourselves. And what have universities done in terms of building up their digital infrastructure, capacity to teach and learn online, and enter in a risk analysis and contingency planning mode. And also what is very important to our discussion today is that we have to recognize that in many countries, online education and e-learning have not been looked upon favorably. Many QA systems do not provide them with the same approach as on-campus education. And in some countries, regulations are outright hostile. I remember looking at the new higher education law in Peru, for example, and I know we have at least one, perhaps more 
participants today from Peru, noting that there were specific provisions penalizing universities through in respect to online education. For example, you could not become a university president or a dean of a faculty if you had gotten your doctoral degree online. That was considered as something negative. So what's been happening in the past few weeks, few months? These are pictures of yesterday. Do you remember that with nostalgia? And this is the new today. So from one day to the other, what was really a hobby for a few eccentric, innovative professors has become the main support for teaching and learning. Now, the switch to online education has not been easy because it's, you need prerequisites, which many, many universities, especially in developing countries, did not have proper connection to the internet, a learning management system, digital content, trained instructors, prepared students, and alignment of assessment in terms of the methods and modalities with the new teaching and learning approach. Now this, what's the scrambling, the improvisation that many universities have gone through has made us aware of structural problems faced by many of them. The students, as I mentioned earlier, it's been a tragedy for some students who lost their lodgings, but they could not travel back home. So they were stuck without a place to stay, without the resources. To. And then access to the internet. A recent survey in, Egypt, in uh, Brazil, for example, showed that 17% of the students could not access the internet. In fact, in some countries I'm aware of, in South Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, some of the professors themselves could not access, they didn't have a computer or a tablet or a good subscription. Insufficient digital infrastructure. And this has made us realize that many universities had the funding model that was not sustainable. Over-reliance on private funding, even in some uh, public universities where they have two tracks, or over-reliance on international students, as the UK is uh, realizing now. So the main priority in this transition period has to be about quality, integrity, and student engagement. How do you put in place an effective online teaching system? How do you maintain the integrity of the program content and assessment? And how do you ensure student readiness? How do you make sure that you have sufficient interaction? It's not a quantum matter of, I'm going to record my lecture and put it online and that's online education. How do you make sure that students apply higher order thinking skills? So to finish, how do we prepare for the future, for a very uncertain future? First, we have to recognize that governments and quality assurance agencies have a very important role to play. In the richer countries, the universities are lucky because their country is able to provide them with some emergency package with additional financial resources. But this is not the case in many other countries, especially developing countries where on the contrary, to face the health emergency, governments have been reallocating resources from education to health. And then the access to broadband. Now, some countries have national research and education networks, NREDS, internet too, but not many universities were connected to them. So I see many governments making an effort to give access to broadband at subsidized prices to universities and students. And then making efforts for capacity building of the faculty members. Ghana, for example, has is working together with the UK Open University to offer capacity building to all le lecturers in Ghanaian universities. And then, as Susanna was mentioning in her opening remarks, the importance of being much more flexible 
in our QA and accreditation rules, criteria, and procedures. And then the bulk of the effort is on the universities, how to very quickly train, not only the professor, but all to the students. The fact that I'm spending a lot of time on Facebook every day doesn't mean that I am ready to learn through e-learning, that I have the autonomy, the independence, the capacity to do that. Adaptation of the assessment methods, examinations and graduation requirements. During this term to finish the year, how are students going to graduate? How am I going to select my students next fall if the national exams have been scratched down, if the te national tests are not available? And one of the important lessons that universities are learning as they go is the importance of monitoring student learning and offering support. First, you need to identify at-risk students and then be ready to help them through financial help, academic help, but perhaps more importantly, during this crisis, we realize that social, the social, social emotional well-being of the students is really at uh, risk and so having psychological support students who all, all of a sudden find themselves isolated with anxiety with several big issues that have to be faced and the last point important point i want to make is that you know online learning should not be a spectator sport it doesn't mean that you know for seven hours a day i'm going to be glued to my Zoom screen, listening passively to the professor. No, you really need to engage the students, to have a student-centered education online, more, even more than uh, when you are on campus. And I want to quote the title of a book on this topic, which is really a great book, which I highly recommend. It's a three-part title. It says, Sparking Curiosity, Igniting Passion, unleashing genius and i'm going to try to show a short video to illustrate what it means how to make something that's not always appealing much more exciting stimulating in a positive way so let's see if the video is going to work This is a metro station in Sweden. So how do you make our online teaching experience engaging, stimulating? One important lesson that you need to promote a sense of belonging. You need to clearly explain what are the expectations so that students know under this new modality what they need to do. Don't go for the most sophisticated technology. Use technology that is easy to access. 
And the most important point is promote active participation of the students and exchange of ideas between the students and the lecturer among the students themselves. And also provides meaningful feedback and assessments. And this is the right time to introduce education innovations. So we already talked about active and interactive learning experiential learning, multidisciplinary approach, problem-based, competency-based, use simulations that in many disciplines can be done online as well. And most importantly, align your new assessment approach with the new teaching and learning approach. I always talk about the golden triangle, bringing curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment together, relying on adequate technology. and choose technologies that can help you. Artificial intelligence, big data, virtual reality. University of Oklahoma has been relying on robots with artificial intelligence for many years to interact with the students needing help, guidance, advice when they go to the library. University of Victoria in New Zealand has been using artificial reality, AR, to, you, to have pro offer to their students what they call a field visit every day. Most of their programs used uh, virtual reality, sorry, VR, as the main platform to engage the students. In conclusion, I hope you can look at this little picture which I believe describes 2020 very adequately. So we start on the left. This is when we be began our semester. And slowly we had to make a transition and to reduce our expectations. But perhaps more importantly, I think this picture illustrates the, the big challenge of the psychological welfare of students and sometimes even instructors face with this massive transition. So what, when we look at the new future, we had to think about how to build resilience, how to build connections, foster wellness, make sure that everybody finds a purpose in this new environment and embrace healthy thoughts. So for each university, each participant, I ask you, what is your plan for the post-COVID-19 era? And I talk about the three R's. What's your response to make sure that you maintain quality and integrity of the learning experience? How are you preparing for the recovery? Are you going to adapt to a new situation or go back to business as usual? And how do you build resilience? How are you going to anticipate risk and get stronger to be able to cope with future stress situations? So my priorities for the future are to keep first the university community safe. That should be your first priority. Maintain the operation of the university as a place of learning. And also, how do you engage with society? Universities are places where you have very learned, you know, highly so learned people who have the knowledge, who have the scientific evidence. And today, more than any time, we need, universities need to play a role as scientific advisors for society and government. A friend of mine who is university president in Brazil, for, for example, was telling me that in the past few months, he would not have imagined how often he, in public forum, he had had to defend the importance of vaccines, how to explain that no, planet Earth is not flat. So, and the importance of having healthy behaviors during this pandemic. And last but not least, prepare the future. Are you going to go back to the old education model 
or design a new one, perhaps a blended approach. Are you going to go to go back to your old business model? And please do incorporate risk analysis and contingency planning. And I finish with a quote from Seneca, the Roman philosopher, whose words from 2000 years ago, I think are even more valid today. He used to say that there is no favorable wind for those who don't know where they are going. <laughs> Over to you, and I believe we, I have prepared a polling question, which is going to be shown to you now. So here you are seeing the question, you are already responding. After the pandemic is over, can we expect to see universities all over the world going back to fast-to-fast -fast teaching with additional health protections, continuing with online education or relying on a new blended approach? And most of you, 75%, seem to think that the third option will be the right arm. No for the new future. Over to you, Susanna. Well, uh, I would like to thank you very much for a very you know, thought-provoking uh, presentation, giving us a general picture of what is going on globally now. I think that everybody has already acknowledged that, well, all the, all the challenges that you have raised It, it, it refers to each of the contexts that our participants come from. It's global, actually. What I would, um, I really liked your um, quote about the wind. And indeed, we just need to be clear what we want to achieve, what we, we want to get, and then use all of the opportunities that this situation raises for us to actually uh, I mean, work towards achieving that goal. I mean, this is the time for, definitely this is the time for creativity, for innovation. And your video uh, really nicely demonstrated this, how to make the challenge into an opportunity, how to use it and how to make people engaged. On well, in, in the recent um, webinars um, from uh, Francisco Marmaleo, I had a very beautiful, like, you know, Um, quote that he said that um, uh, teaching online is like flying, uh, teaching, no, teaching online is like having the car driver fly a plane. Well, I mean, this is not the same. I mean, it's really challenging and uh, all the while majority of the universities, they reported like, um, Uh, they reported immediately that, well, we all successfully have moved online, we're all 100% online and it works well. But like you mentioned, Jamil, the issues related with teaching and learning methodology, with clarity in terms of learning outcomes, with assessment. And we all have got to know that, well, uh, the current IT solutions, they don't yet support the, um, uh, you know, um, accurate and valid assessment of the learning outcomes. So there are many learning outcomes which you can't assess online. So how do you do that? And um, especially when you look through the questions coming from the um, you know, participants, again, most majority of them are concerned about the assessment. How do you do it? How do you check the achievements? But I think that we will leave the questions um, to the um, uh, end and we will discuss it at the end. Um, Like, um, if we just, um, I would like to, um, I hope everybody sees my screen and um, yeah, we have the speakers here. I would like to thank you, Jamil, for a very uh, nice um, uh, thought provoking presentation, a very valuable ideas that you shared here in terms of the management at the institutional level. 
and how the institutions have to adapt to this new reality. And I would like to give the floor now to listen more about the particular cases coming from Ireland. And Neith O'Reilly, uh, the floor is yours to share your experience with us. Thank you very much, Susanna. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Neve O'Reilly. I know it's a tricky name, it's an Irish name. Uh, and I'm CEO of AINTHUS, the National Adult Learning Organization in Ireland. And I'm just going to share my screen, if that's okay, Susanna. I'm going to just move on and share my screen um, for my presentation. See, I think we're okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, it's a real honor to be here and I do have a uh, connection to Inquahi. Uh, I'm on the board of QQI, so it's Quality Qualifications Ireland, who is a member of Inquahi. Um, but in the case for today, I thought it would be useful to talk about the governmental response in Ireland to the COVID pandemic and how we collectively came together to mitigate education disadvantage, specifically focusing on education disadvantaged learners. So specific cohorts, such as travelers, Roma, people who are generally excluded within the education system and really have to um, make huge efforts to gain access and how we support them, because we know there's been an exacerbation of disadvantage. So I want to talk about the case study because we've learned a lot through this process what was interesting about it, it wasn't just focusing on higher education, whereas our remit and aims is, is safeguarding the rights of all adults to learning from basic education, further education, adult education and higher education. So what was quite unique about it, it was taking a whole cross education approach. And this is what the government set up a specific working group. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Just to give you a sense, um, this is the physical Department of Education and Skills in Ireland and the hand outside is a wishing hand and I just thought it was a kind of a helpful analogy to look at. We were trying to hold a learner and particularly disadvantaged learners in our hands through the COVID pandemic and how we can support them collectively. So the Department of Education and Skills set up a number of working groups immediately in response to what was happening around the pandemic. So you see like a constellation of different working groups. The one I'm going to talk about is the Mitigating Educational Disadvantage Group, which I chair and which my colleagues form the Secretariat, and to describe the work that we did, which I think also resonates globally. I think it complements some of the points that Jamil uh, made in his brilliant presentation. So I'd hopefully they will be useful for your own context. In terms of the in terms of reference is not the most exciting slide to show, but I think it's important to say I mean, this group was set up in, in a time of crisis. It was after St. Patrick's Day, it was the lockdown, and we had to look at how can we come together across the education system to focus on the needs of educationally disadvantaged learners. So our role, um, as described by the Department of Education and Skills, was to scope out all of the issues that disadvantaged learners faced and how they have been impacted on this COVID-19 public health emergency. So we undertook different um, ranges of evidence gathering. Particularly from the learner perspective, we did a number of surveys with learners. I also drew in a lot of expertise from people who've engaged in educational disadvantage, people who have um, expertise in remote emergency learning and disadvantage. So I tried to draw people in who could immediately turn around really effective recommendations for the government in which to respond to the crisis that was happening. I fed in the information to the planning, as I mentioned before, the whole tertiary education uh, COVID-19 response planning structure, a constellation that I mentioned in the previous slide. And we tried to really focus on short-term responses that would mitigate the impact for disadvantaged learners. We also looked at contingency planning and tried to consider how co uh, consistency and evenness and provision could be offered. So the work that we had, we've done, and this is a little map of Ireland here, but it was a huge group to begin with. There were 31 members coming from 23 agencies. We had three academic experts, and we also had people who were in the community, community education. So we had people with great expertise coming across together, professors, policymakers, researchers, 
um, experts, um, learners. So we really got a great sense of what was happening on the ground and were able to turn around recommendations quickly. We had 15 meetings online. Again, we never met in person, so uh, we had to be creative in our engagement processes. And initially we had meetings twice a week, so it was quite a rapid turnaround in terms of what we were trying to achieve. But I just thought it would be useful to reflect on that, the wishing hand of how we held the learner in our hands across the, the tertiary education system. And there's a phrase in Irish, um, similar to my tricky Irish name, I'll just say it in Irish, which means there's no strength without unity. And really, we all had a duty of care to support learners right across the education system, from higher education, further education, adult education, to come together and look at solutions with great expertise and has been able to draw upon that. So it created quite a unique structure and was breaking down silos between different parts of the education system where we looked at identifying what were the issues and coming up with solutions. We also looked at what collaboration can happen, what expertise um, is happening in higher education or further education that could be shared in order to address the issues that were raised, which I will talk about the issues in a moment, and really getting the informed insights. We, we try to be solutions focused and really offer tangible solutions to the Department of Education. Some of the solutions could be implemented at institutional level and we really kept focusing on those marginalized learners. They had experienced an exacerbation of existing inequalities and we were very conscious of that. The challenges that they had, whether it was homelessness, domestic violence increased during the time, all of the issues that were you know, in existence before COVID-19 really came to the fore. And we looked at how can we support these learners um, within this very difficult context. And also linking into existing policy structures. So in terms of the outputs, we developed eight papers and they're always a draft paper. And I think in a time of pandemic, uh, perfectionism goes out the window and you have to be pragmatic. So what we tried to do was sift through all the specific issues that were raised and develop high quality but draft papers, all of which are online on our website. We looked at issues around digital learning, um, emergency remote learning, what needs to be done. And I will mention a couple of recommendations we talked about assessment and I think what was quite interesting is that the issues around assessment and higher education were similar to further education, vocational education and basic education. I think that was something that was quite unique in the work that we've done with this group has been able to identify the commonalities across the education system. That point around learner engagement and I'll speak to this point in a little bit more detail. That interaction and that relationship, which is central to the education experience between the tutor, the facilitator and that learner, was really stretched to its capacity, its limits during this COVID-19 pandemic of how you can maintain that communication and that support for learners, particularly those who are educationally disadvantaged, was really a, a crucial issue that needed to be addressed. Community education, we specifically focused on that because the future higher education learners are also going to transition from other parts of the education system, such as basic education or further education, and how they can be supported to fulfill their aspirations to move to higher education or indeed other forms of education or, or uh, roles um, in employment. One thing that we focused on also was educational equity and learner cohorts, and we identified specific learner cohorts that have specific needs. So members of the Roma community, um, a minority group in Ireland, the traveler community, lone parents, women who are parenting alone, people who are caring for family members, all of those learners who have specific extra issues that they must deal with, people who left school early. So we try to identify a more nuanced understanding of their issues during COVID, but identifying the commonalities that they faced across community education, further education into higher education. We also looked at what tutors need and practitioners and supporting tutors through this very difficult time, um, creating communities of practice were recommended, how they are disconnected from their peers, how they can adapt, develop new different appropriate pedagogy um, approaches in an online context. And of course, the financial barriers. This is obviously a huge one. People have lost their jobs. They can't work over the summer. The financial implications were obviously very significant for learners and mental health. And this came up as well in my uh, colleague's presentation, absolute need to focus on the mental health and wellness of the learners. So all of those papers are free to look at online. 
I just wanted to pick up on the point of digital learning and disadvantage. Um, that's the paper that we developed in April. So we really tried to turn around these papers as quick as possible and feed them out across the education system through our Department of Education and Skills. And then in an emergency remote learning context, we were talking about the need for technology to be able to complete assignments, having access to devices, but also the software and very, keep, very much keeping it simple, simple and similar to what Jamil was saying, um, trying to overcomplicate things. How can people get back up online? How can they do their assignments in a simple manner? Develop loan systems for devices if you don't have access and even the challenge of um, obtaining devices, there was such a demand for them, was a lot of possibilities of trying to think outside the box, looking at a loan system, um, of looking at the Wi-Fi issues as well. And we had some progress with that in terms of increased data. Because one thing that we found out is that the learners who we were really focusing on, they, many of them didn't have a laptop many were using their phones to complete their assignments. Now, can you imagine trying to use your smartphone? And I suppose they were really trying to work around it. It's not sustainable into the future, but it was a particular method, and I suppose, in a, the context we were in, of being able to continue your learning. But obviously, it's not a satisfactory one. So we were trying to get laptops as well, but um, and indeed, access to the Wi-Fi and the expense. Um, there was some movement on that in terms of being able to extend the data. Uh, packages, ensuring that people had the space, in, um, you know, to be a particularly marginalised learners, so they didn't have the distractions, that they had a space to learn, that the space to be able to engage in assessment that was fair and equitable. But that was a real challenge for people who were living in, uh, particularly asylum seekers who were living in very crowded centres and people in temporary accommodation, people living in one bedroom apartments with a family, minding children, children off school. It was a real challenge that learners faced in that and looking at how we can look at creating different kinds of campuses of learning. Um, so we're looking at how we could have access to different public buildings, different libraries where people could actually go in and socially distance, but able to engage in learning in a more effective way. We looked at developing a resource kit for learners around you know, the management tips, study management tips, how to succeed in remote learning, provide training obviously to institutions, building the capacity of the tutors and the learners to engage in a remote learning context and to develop a resource hub, which we did online as well from our website. I just wanted to pick up on the point about learner-student engagement and particularly learners that we were really focusing on. Many of the tutors went above and beyond making phone calls for half an hour, talking to learners to see how they're getting on. I mean, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Learning was not at the priority because they were just trying to survive in the difficult times they had, whether they've lost their job, dealing with mental health issues or other issues that we mentioned. So that learner-student engagement was vital because the work that had been done around access, we didn't want to lose it and we want to ensure that learners felt free and comfortable to be able to come back when they could. So it was about prioritising the learners' needs and trying to get them back into the physical environment as soon as the institutions opened. That's what the learners were saying. They had no space at home, they didn't have access to devices. And when there is the opening up of campuses, they should be prioritised because they don't have, they have specific needs. Um, maintaining that connection res requires resources of having people within education institutions specifically engaging with the cohort of learners that we're talking about, whether it's those phone calls, emails, Zooms, all of the different things that were needed in addition. Um, really to also say this is a, a very unusual context. This is not business as usual. People were dealing with bereavements and just taking a moment to say, we're here for you in the education institution and come back. We will help you through this time. And so it's not having huge expectations on the learners because they're already dealing uh, and having that empathy and empathetic um, approach and communication, telling the learners what is happening, um, when they can expect to go back in, how the assessment process is going to be. I mentioned mobile messaging, but also posts was used a lot in terms of posting out information and assessments. So in trying to collate all of this information into some kind of cohesive framework. In Ireland, we have a new uh, government department as well. Uh, I mentioned the Department of Education and Skills. We also have a new uh, Department of Further and Higher Education Research, Innovation and Science that was just established last week. We have a new minister within that. So I was trying to think how we can put together the learning from this group 
in a cohesive way rather than having a huge uh, shopping list of eight papers. So this is obviously like all of this is a work in progress. So the first point is having pillar one, that learner student financial support. If your basic needs are not, aren't met, it doesn't matter how great the education experience is, you won't be able to get to the class, you won't be able to have access, all of those things that are needed, so grants, childcare. The second thing was support for learners to navigate the system, particularly for new learners who hadn't been in higher education before, they didn't have that connection. This new context brings a whole new challenge to those learners who won't get the initial engagement around how you can have really effective mentoring and orientation when you go in and having appropriate guidance. Peer support, that sense of belonging. I mean, that's about building social capital, connection, belonging, making friends, the basic thing of a human interaction in the education experience and how that needs to be prioritized. There's been some great work. And for example, UCD, where learners are trained up as mentors for induction online and ensuring that learners have that sense of connectedness with each other, with their peers, but also with the lecturers and tutors. In terms of pillar four, the, the mental health and well-being, if you don't have the wellness to learn, that's absolutely essential. So having one-to-one -one support and well-being programs is something that we recommended. That learner-student engagement and that outreach, and we really think outreach, getting back out into the communities, engaging with learners who will have dropped off um, during this process and saying that there is an opportunity to come back and really putting the support and resources into that um, outreach and access work. Um, and then finally, that blended learning support within the new context, as I mentioned before, having devices, understanding um, how to engage in a remote learning context. One-to-one -one support for learners as well was something that came up and then training for tutors. So with all our work in AINTHIS, we try to bring it back to the learner. Uh, we're the voice of adult learning. So I just wanted to leave the last two slides with a couple of quotes. We did an extensive survey. I mean, Ireland is quite a small country. So we had a survey of 900 learners and we had a focus group of 60 learners in a very short period of time to get a sense of their experience during COVID. And people were talking about, like, I took time off because of my mental health. The tutor stays in touch and they're like, there's no rush back, take your time. That really meant a lot to them. They felt like they could then go back in um, because it's a big ask for people who have a lot going on in their lives to engage in a, what can be a very challenging, lonely, isolated, remote learning experience. So it's trying to encourage them to come back in and, you know, take the plunge to continue. One person said we only have one laptop and three children are using it because the schools were closed as well. We learn more from class discussions and social interaction than anything else. That interaction is part of the learning, so this needs to continue somehow. So having the um, that methodology that engages those very discursive is really important. I'm talking about some people were positive, so don't want to be all negative. Uh, I can learn in my own time and spend as long as I want or as short as I like. They help me to take up my own initiative. I have a very short video that I just want to end. It's like, why is this all really important? And I just want to draw your attention to a very short panel um, of learners who describe their experiences of going back into basic education. Uh, people who are asylum seekers, people with disability, people who left school early. And just to get a sense of all of this effort and our collective effort of working across the tertiary system is so valuable and so important, particularly at this time, my contact uh, details are there, of course, but I'm going to do my best to share um, this video with you. I'll just be one moment and hopefully it will work. Um, there we go. It's 10 seconds, so. I always felt like, you know, gosh, I couldn't go for that, I couldn't go for this. Like, you know, age really is only a number. It brings out the confidence in people. When you're comfortable in your environment, it brings out the confidence, it brings out the leadership skills. Community education is, it empowers you as a woman or a man that has gone back to education and it gives you advice and uh, it's a place of healing. For me now, I would say community education through UNCOSAN has empowered me and supported me to support others and promote integration and be a strong advocate. We were treated like adults, unlike some other places I've been to. That was the biggest thing for me. 
if you treat people with respect and like adults, you in turn will get treated like that too. So I just wanted to end on the purpose of all the work that we do. All the videos are online and I can share them and look forward to discussion on this. So thank you very much. Pass back to Susanna. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an amazing, you know, experience to have shared. Thank you very much. It's really nice to, I mean, uh, it's exciting to see how the government actually uh, reacted in a timely manner. And uh, specifically, I like the slide where you uh, put the government and then the students, student and learner, like you adopted the student centered approach trying to because in the new in the new reality you had a new um cases to deal with new cases new cases of disadvantaged students to get to deal with it's not like in the normal times you deal with the cases that we know and the uh, groups that you, you are familiar with you start already handling like and i think that um the commendations go to the government because at the very early stage you identified those groups and tried to target them and support them enable them i like the whole i you said it like different pillars but it looked like you took it from the very basic and took it top to the top of the taxonomy up to enabling the learners i mean in the new environment and how how to experiment it how to learn and how to gain knowledge how to survive in this that's really amazing and as i hear like you know the feedback and the discussion coming here uh, this is a very good example, and I'm sure that majority, ma many, many governments have come up with very brilliant solutions to this. I, I it would also be useful to hear um, what was the specific approach to the faculty, because they are also, if you divide them into the groups, you would find a new groups of disadvantaged faculty as well. So how, uh, just briefly, if you could tell us, well, how did you handle that situation when it came to the faculty? they are the drivers of the education process at this point and the way they manage this difficult mm -hmm. situation and actually uh, leads to the learning of the state a lot of things depend on their managing of the classroom how did you target the problems we had the representatives of the Irish Universities Association on the mitigating educational disadvantage group. So they got to feed all of the issues that were raised at local level. So we had a representation from um, the technological universities or TIA as well. So we had that opportunity to feed into practice. But the main focus was about identifying the issues and making recommendations for the government. So we will continue the work as well of this group and look at the impact that we've made as well. So it was a partnership between all of the stakeholders, the representative of the institutions, um, ourselves and the civil society sector and policymakers, which made it quite unique, but also very effective in terms of change. Yeah, I think that this situation is really challenging also for the, another group, which is the government authorities, the policymakers, they also found themselves in a totally different environment and definitely needed some sort of support coming to. And those issues, well, we still have time to discuss, but I would like to um, thank you very much, Niamh, for this beautiful presentation. Really, I absolutely enjoyed every moment of how you carefully and cautiously and, you know, with passion, you dealt with the student, you know, life. And that's really um, very encouraging to see. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to um, give the floor uh, to our next speaker, um, Paul uh, and um, Paul Gaston. And uh, it's our honor to host um, uh, the, um, uh, the expertise, the rich expertise he brings in and has to share. And Paul, um, I give the floor to you to present yourself and Good. then delve into your presentation and your okay. uh, Good morning. Uh, if we could uh, go back to the original uh, screen at this point. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to take just a, a moment or two before I begin the uh, presentation to offer my own welcome to all of you. It's been fun to think of, think of you uh, having breakfast or having dinner or enjoying the happy hour or a very late night or a very early morning. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Sometimes when you get on a plane and the, the plane is departing a little late, the pilot will say, 
We're going to try to make up some time in the air. Well, I'm going to be that pilot for you this morning, and I'm going to try to make up a little time in the air so that we have the time to listen to your questions and to respond uh, as, as well as, as we can. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to be able to talk about a project that was initiated and sponsored by Lumina Foundation, which I am a consultant to. That's an independent, uh, private uh, foundation in Indianapolis, Indiana, that devotes all of its attention to the strengthening of post-secondary education. And it, it really does uh, make a priority of, of trying to see post-secondary education as a system that is both rich in opportunity and yet difficult to navigate. And so how do we help students uh, make, take advantage of the opportunities and yet manage to navigate uh, as, as well? Uh, my own interest in, uh, in this particular audience today, the international audience, uh, began uh, a number of years ago when I began work on what is still the only hardbound book on the Bologna process, a process that uh, is important, of course, for Europe and, and for others, but I think it also in a broader sense created a challenge, and that was the title of my book, The Challenge of Bologna, a challenge to educators throughout the world to take outcomes seriously, to look at opportunities for crediting students with the work that they had achieved on a broad and international basis. These are challenges that we still are trying to meet and, and we still are following that uh, example to an extent. Well, I'm going to, at this point, uh, attempt to share with you uh, a brief presentation having to do with the project that is, that I think, uh, that, that is critical. I'm, I'm waiting for it to appear as one of the opportunities. And if it well, doesn't- some of, the, some of the presenters are, uh, some of the, uh, you know, participants are already ready to fasten the belts. So <laughs> you go. Oh, okay, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to choose. I'm, I'm not getting that choice of, at the moment. There we go. Everyone uh, able to, to see that now? Very good. So the, uh, the project that I want to talk about is, is a project that two years ago when it began was a timely project. It's now become really an urgent one. It was important then. It's really critical now. And it was primarily a, a domestic project then, seen in terms of, of education in the United States. But increasingly, as a result of the pandemic, it's become clear that this is, uh, in many ways, uh, it is in many ways uh, a, a, a problem that is one we necessarily share with the world as a whole. And this is really the challenge. Uh, serving students well in three, in three senses, making it possible for them to, to achieve what they hope to achieve in a timely way, that we pay close attention to, to gaps in equity, gaps that have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis, and that we provide high quality credentials to all learners in a post-pandemic world. It's a U.S. initiative, as I've said, but I, we believe that it has implications internationally. Uh, I don't like to read PowerPoint slides to you, but I'll let you have a, a, a glance at this one. We're talking really about a, a, a very well-qualified group of people who met three times and remained in discussion uh, between those meetings. And over time, over the course of the year, they developed recommendations that they thought to be eminently practical and achievable, but also critical. These are the recommendations uh, that the data needs to be improved if we are to make meaningful progress, that the commitment to quality and equity needs to be made active. We can't just voice it as a value. We have to work in ways that will actually advance 
equality and equity. And by the way, one of the observations very early in the process was that when we are talking about quality and equity, we're not talking about two distinct priorities. We are really talking about one and the same. We're talking about a single priority with dimensions having to do with quality and equity. The pathways in terms of enabling students to navigate the credentials environment, all of which depends on engagement with the faculty, collaboration across institutions, across states, across nations, across the world. And unfortunately, it's one of those realities that we're dealing with. We have to be sure that when institutions close or merge with others, that students are protected, that the communities in which those institutions are located are protected in some way. More urgent, more compelling now, all as a result of the pandemic. So looking briefly at strong data sets, you can again read the, uh, the bullets here, but uh, it's important we think to make progress in any reasonable and, and realistic way to look at ways of uh, documenting inequities for one thing and, and to track how effective we are in addressing those inequities. To look at the example of the Bologna process in creating a, a common platform for student achievement so that they may always have access to the work that they've done and to the documentation of their uh, preparedness. Quality and equity, again, to make the point that, that commitment to one necessarily requires commitment to the other. You can't really have quality unless you're committed to equity. You don't really have equity unless there is a commitment to quality. We think that approaching these as a single priority is the key to making progress that's genuine and meaningful to our students. Quality credentials are essential to all that we believe to be important in terms of, of uh, student preparedness and opportunity, mobility across generations, and very important, we think, meaningful civic participation. One of the visions that, that animated the United States in its early days was the, the sense that the common interest, the public good, was more important than the individual advantage. We've lost some of that, and now we're trying to reclaim it. What we know about quality is that it's questioned that employers are questioning the effectiveness of the education that we provide. We know that the way the curriculum is adapting is not keeping pace with the way the workplace is adapting. Again, a process that was important and uh, worth looking at two years ago and is now particularly critical and urgent. Uh, we know that employers have certain priorities in mind and they aren't confident that we are enabling students to meet those priorities. You see the final bullet here about an assessment project that Lumina Foundation uh, operated. And that suggests, we think, a real problem because effective critical thinking is so important, not only to success as a student, but also to a healthy polity, to a healthy civic society. What we know about equity is that there isn't much. There isn't enough equity. 34% uh, of all individuals 25 to 65 have earned a four-year degree in the, in the States. But look at the figures for Latinos, Black individuals, Native Americans. Seamless pathways. We talk about credentials these days. They've proliferated enormously in terms of what they are like and who offers them. But what we know is that it's a very complicated world out there and that students find it easy to make mistakes. So we're looking at ways of providing guidance for students. And one of the ways of providing that guidance is by opening up a number of pathways that, that are coherent, that offer continuity, that offer 
cumulative learning. And the bridges that we build enabling students to cross not only from one program to another, but from one institution to another, from one aspiration to another, these are ultimately, in the world that we're living in, pathways to success. I was uh, interested in the extent to which this illustration prepared, you know, nearly two years ago, has an eerie kind of resemblance to some of those that we're seeing today uh, as illustrations of the pandemic. But the real intent of this is just to suggest that when a student looks at the opportunities out there for various kinds of credentials, it can be pretty intimidating. It can be pretty frightening. And so the idea of pathways, the idea of bridges that we provide for students can be critical to success. Completion rates, uh, drilling down a little bit more carefully in, into that figure, uh, we know that uh, only 60% of all students complete at all within six years. But then again, the figures for black students and for Latino students suggest another level of, of inequity and a level of efficiency for institutions as, as a whole. Because if only 40, 50, 60% of students are taking a credential after six years, there's a lot of effort, a lot of investment that is not paying off in a timely way. Essential to all of this, we believe to be faculty development, really can't make genuine progress without the faculty being on board. That was an early lesson, as you know, of, of the Bologna process. And uh, the more thoroughly faculty became engaged, the more successful and effective the process became. Uh, the importance of student success is reinforced when we engage the faculty and consult with the faculty and enable the faculty to be of assistance. Looking ahead, as I say, this is a regrettable priority, but one that is a real one. Uh, there's some implications here for quality assurance for us and I think for others as well throughout the world. One is that we need to pay closer attention more frequently to the health of our institutions. Another is that we need to look at alternatives. And one of those is frankly mergers between institutions of like mind and, and compatible resources. But we also need to be able to uh, alert students when there is the likelihood of institutional closures. And we need to do so in ways that are responsible to the institutions involved so that we don't initiate by the information we provide a kind of negative spiral. But when institutions must close and must enable their students to find other opportunities, we have to make sure that there's sufficient planning for that to take place. And we also need to be aware of the fact that institutions live within cities and towns and broader communities. And we need to be alert to the health of those as well. So I'm not going to read these to you, but uh, I want to suggest to you that behind the work of the task force as you read through these yourselves uh, was the idea that, that values are fine, aspirations are fine, but we really ought to point to things that we can do, that we should be doing in order to serve the ends that we believe to be important. Just to take one or two as an example, that confusing landscape of credentials requires us to provide better advising to our students that is for far more than course scheduling, that, that pays attention to what their aspirations are, that, that looks very carefully at the prior learning that they bring to their education and looks at ways in which they might be able to blend uh, online learning or on the job learning uh, with their classroom education in order to prepare themselves effectively for satisfying lives and for the world of work. Finally, the uh, number six is worth paying attention to, particular attention, the, the lo looking at alternate delivery systems, as my colleagues have said this morning, alternate ways of providing active learning, shorter term courses, competency-based programs, work integrated options, all of which come with an assurance of quality provided by careful monitoring and clear standards. 
here are a few more. And, and these two uh, attempt to suggest that there are, there are some real things that we can do, important things that we can do to make those values that were expressed live for, for all of us. Uh, one of which, number 10, looking at, at ways of awarding credit to people who have been at, at work in the world and who have learned things that are important and that are part of their educational portfolio. And, and just a few more, uh, the guided pathways we've talked about, paying particular attention to working adults. We used to uh, speak in the States about uh, traditional students and, uh, and adult students. Well, more and more our traditional students are our working students. And we need to build a system that understands that and that, that accommodates a wide range of aspirations, a wide range of engagements, a wide range of obligations outside the institution and outside the, uh, out, out, outside the system. So, and then finally, I, I would, because this is a quality assurance discussion in part, that we make sure that, that all of our degree pathways do guarantee the acquisition of the essential competencies for long-term success. Some of the employer expectations that I was speaking of uh, just a little while ago. Uh, again, to remind you that uh, I'm here speaking on, on behalf of Lumina Foundation, which looks forward to a system easy to navigate, fair results, and meeting the nation's need for talent through a broad range of credentials. And uh, with that, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, engage your questions and to engage with my, uh, with my remaining uh, colleagues with the time that we, we have left. So thank you very much. Paul, you had questions, right? For polling? I'm sorry? You had questions for polling, right? Yes, we do have questions for polling, yeah. and uh, and let's uh, let's have those now. They were supposed to be triggered by my presentation, but but they weren't. So let's let's look at those and let's uh, let's hear from you. Let's go back to poll one just for a moment, if we could. And so here we are. And uh, uh, well, actually, it's it's. Uh, So the three choices here, quality must be the first priority, addressing inequities, the first priority. And uh, I see that my message uh, may have been communicated because uh, I'm finding a, a, a robust uh, level of support for looking at both of these priorities as really the same priority. That If there's one takeaway that I wanted to share with you, it would be that. So let's, let's move on to the next question. So once the period of post, uh, okay, assuring effective quality assurance will require above all, and where do you think the leadership has to uh, come from? That's the question here. Uh, independent organizations uh, such as INQUAHI or government standards or greater institutional autonomy. And here the range is, is broader and that's, that's uh, a good thing because I think one possible answer to this was it really will require uh, a working partnership of all three of these important uh, constituencies. So that's a good a good representation. Why don't we uh, wrap up now with the uh, the final question? And this has to do with the trends that we are likely to see in this regard in the post secondary uh, and post COVID uh, era. So structural changes. Uh, reliance, increased reliance on accreditation and other forms of 
independent quality assurance, oversight by governmental agencies, and more conspicuous uh, leadership, and that should be by a few uh, leading uh, institutions, authorities, and uh, opinion leaders. And so that's, that's interesting that many of you do anticipate some degree of structural change. And I think that's probably something we are indeed uh, likely to see. But I also like the way the line down there at the bottom is stretching. And that has to do with all of the above. Probably we are going to see structural change. Uh, organizations like Inquahi and other accrediting organizations and quality assurance organizations will need to step up and will need to be relied on more, more than they have in the past. There will undoubtedly be increased oversight by governmental agencies, but ultimately all of the above. So thank you for your participation in those uh, three uh, uh, brief polls. And now let's, uh, let's open up the conversation. Well, thank you very much, Paul. This was really a very, um, a very exciting um, presentation. It was really nice to see how U.S. actually is responding, like you know, to um, equity and quality. I liked your links between equity and quality, and basically what you have done. It's like a very beautiful culmination of the. I'm um, taking it to the very beautiful cul culmination of this beautiful discussion. Is that things are changing and we all acknowledge this and definitely the approaches to quality assurance starting from the definition of quality it all needs to be revamped i mean you i mean uh we have been dealing with quality as fitness for purpose for years but as you have rightly mentioned with the old diversification of provisions over there and with the all experience in quality assurance, this is the right time to revisit. No one model no longer fits all. So we have to come up with the different approaches to defining quality, to more creative approach, to keep in line with the developments. It seems like we are really lagging in the developments. I mean, quality assurance hardly being able to catch up with all the new um, developments that are there. And your presentation beautifully uh, led us to the conclusion that, well, this is the right time to revise, to revise and to um, um, rethink and reimagine the quality. By the way, uh, Inquahi is uh, our annual forum will be in forum in uh, Moscow. Like I mean, we were planning to have a, our annual forum in Moscow, and uh, now we are moving online, still with the Moscow being the host. And we are discussing the, the traditional track, the classical education, and then we're also bringing in the alternative education, the micro-credentials, the new ways of provisions, and the quality assurance for those new ways of provisions, because this is one of the ways to address the access to education, the equity in education, and also to promote, like, target the gaps in the skills and competencies that we are currently facing. So thank you very much. This is a beautiful, uh, you know, uh, presentation of what are the current trends um, despite of COVID, despite of the pandemic we're facing, there is still out there a whole huge area of things that we need to address. And you have rightly mentioned that. Thank you very much. So now I think that it's time if we all of us go to the, I mean, back to the questions and we'll open, uh, we have their specific questions addressed to specific speakers with the names and then um, uh, they are generic questions to everybody. Um, I would like to um, break it down into the categories, like for example, the governance at national level, governance at institution level. How, what is the, let's, let's think about those areas and then we move to the faculty and the students. But basically one of the leading questions throughout all the responses that I have been able to, you know, um, skim over here refers to assessment. So we need to touch on that one <laughs> as a culmination of our discussion as well. But there are a couple of questions which are directly linked to 
uh, Jamil regarding the government and the reflections, I mean, how the government should be responding to it and to, what are the necessary changes the governments need to do to meet all those challenges? So, Jamil, uh, the floor is yours. And I think that we had a couple of good examples coming, like uh, the Irish example, but broadly, from your experience, what do you think that that should be like from governmental perspective? Well, the first one, I think, is to if we go back to Paul's points and uh, Niamh's emphasis and on the in the context of the Irish case also about not separating quality and equity. I think there is a big risk where we're assuming that everything is equal under COVID. It's, the virus doesn't discriminate, you know, whether you, uh, what your nationality, your gender, your income, but it's in truth, there is discrimination. We see already statistics showing that uh, uh, people from minority groups are more uh, fragile and being hit by the disease more strongly. And we see that the, these issues that have been mentioned of access to internet, family conditions, they will make it much more difficult from uh, students from minority groups, low income, etc., to uh, benefit from our responsibility, the financial support to, to help these students. And the second is what you mentioned at the beginning, that the, the criteria for uh, assessment and for accreditation and for quality assurance need to be looked at into a very flexible way. In many countries, we see universities moving away from the grades, from the quantitative assessment to a qualitative assessment. And while some people may think that it is very bad for quality, if we have, I think it's very important to encourage students and to support them in this transition um, that we they had that was forced upon them from one day to the other, you know, I, I know of many universities where on Friday, an email was sent to everybody, we're closing down, come back on Monday, but online. So this, um, yeah, that's uh, the role of the of government of providing, supporting universities with for quality, for capacity building of the instructors, um, and bringing all these elements of flexibility. Unfortunately, many countries we see, we still have very rigid systems and that really has to to go to go away uh, this is a really very um nice reflection and i would like just to add again drawing from the questions that i'm reading through now like uh, true but what should be the what should the governments do in terms of the recognition of this you also mentioned in your uh, presentation that online degrees are not just recognized there I, I mean part of this lack of recognition and challenge in recognizing the online degrees is absence of trust in those degrees so how do you see like you know it, working on the trust what should be there for quality assurance, for higher education institutions, and for the government equally, all of them have to be working on the trust. What do you think should be, and I would in, invite other panel members also to res respond to this question, what should we do to enhance the trust so that the recognition of qualification coming from online degrees is more seamless now, becomes more seamless? Jamil? If I, well, if I just continue on that, and then I'll, sure. Paul, go, go ahead if you want. No, yeah. I was just, just going to, to say at, at the outset that, that one of the things that, that government can do is to uh, encourage uh, genuine discussion about, about outcomes. Because when we're talking about uh, the, the aims of post-secondary education and the effectiveness of post-secondary education and the, you know, the value of assessment, we really are talking about being very clear about outcomes and, and expressing those learning outcomes in terms that students can understand, in terms that faculty members can commit to, and in terms that assessors can then evaluate. So that, I think, is an elementary but important step. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Jamil, uh, you were adding something to yeah, this? If, if I may add, I think this issue of trust is very important. For many years, I've been advocating doing open book, open internet exams and structuring your evaluation, your assessment in such a way that you really want to measure how well students are able to apply their knowledge to the resolution of problems, to high order thinking, critical thinking. And many institutions, many governments are uh, find it very hard to let go. I, I, I know, I think recently I was reading a University of Delhi in India was proposing to do open internet exams and for some reason the authorities were reluctant to give them the, the green light. And I think that this element of trust will be important as we redesign our approaches to assessments and to accreditation and quality assurance. I'd like to comment, Susanna, yeah, just to yeah, give yeah. just a, a point. I'm going to speak slower. I apologize. I speak fast as an Irish person and I really tried my best, but I see some comments that I spoke too fast. So apologies. I'm just passionate about this area. But um, in terms of the issue of trust, I think through this COVID-19 response framework structure that the government set up, it enabled different stakeholders to talk very openly about different challenges around um, remote learning assessment. But really key to that, there was a specific group focusing on quality and assessment that was led by your member, QQI, Quality Qualifications Ireland. And they very quickly responded and put in place robust guidelines to assure quality assurance, uh, to ensure that people had confidence in the system. So I think we were forced to consider remote learning, although I know it's um, many learners, and we did a survey, 80% would prefer to go back to that one-to-one -one, uh, face to face learning. So we're really conscious of that. But in the context of social distancing and people with compromised immune systems who can't be in a higher education institution, it is the option that's there at the moment. So I think by having that structure, that open dialogue across stakeholders, and then for the quality assurance organization agency responding really quickly and providing confidence that really assisted that um, move towards that remote learning and remote assessment. Thank you very much. Um, just uh, as a feedback from the participants, like, do you think that artificial intelligence could be um, supporting the solution for trust, for raising the trust and instilling the trust in provisions? How do you see artificial intelligence helping that? All of us discussed the importance of data, of artificial intelligence, and what is your reflection about trust and artificial intelligence. Jamil, you were saying. Yeah, well, we, over the past five years, I've seen how universities in the US, Canada and Australia have been in, in, incorporating um, big data and artificial intelligence to follow their students, to identify at-risk students very early, to assess which um, tutoring and uh, repeat courses were more effective than others and uh, so there are many uh, there are companies now providing services to universities to help them and especially in this time of switch to online education to use these tools to for to combine both the quality and equity purposes that Paul insisted on that. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, I would just uh, add add to that. I think that that artificial intelligence needs to be seen as as a means, and we need to be very clear about the ends that 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 those means should serve. When we are when we are letting our our needs, our priorities for our students drive the implementation of artificial in, intelligence, uh, I think the results can be can be very helpful. The uh, healthcare uh, professions in in the states and, and perhaps throughout the world have have really been a pioneer uh, in this in this regard there is a lot that can be accomplished without requiring the individual attention of a practitioner 
Uh, I think that we, but, but there, the, 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 the end is very clear. It's, it's the health of the individual. And similarly, I think our ends uh, need to be very clearly stated. And again, I go back to the idea of, of the definition of explicit, measurable, and uh, ultimately significant uh, outcomes. Thank you very much. Neve, your reflection on this part of the discussion? I can't give a reflection on artificial intelligence, to be honest. I don't think I could add anything to what has already been said uh, by colleagues here. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I would like to take this to the next level where a majority of the questions seem to be around assessment and online assessment and specifically how you ensure like um, high quality of um, I mean, uh, online assessment and then specifically how you address the practical assessment of the practical skills. Well, at this point, when we discuss the assessment, I, we, uh, I would welcome to discuss two different parties over involved in here, like faculty and the students from two different perspectives. Um, how do you see that um, um, work? Because um, as of now, we see that assessment has been the major issue. Even the technology, the newest technology is not providing the solution we're expecting. So what are your ideas? What are your reflections on how to resolve this issue? Who wants to start? Well, I'll, I'll uh, jump in. Uh, I think that uh, assessment is an appropriate focus only when the, the other sides of that uh, triad uh, also receive attention. The first is, of course, as I've been saying, you can't really have effective assessment unless you have clear ideas about what you're assessing and why. And that means agreement on clearly stated learning outcomes. And the other end of assessment is how are you using what you learn through assessment to strengthen your educational programs for the benefit of your students. And I think if we begin with those questions, then the discussion of assessment itself, the techniques, the means, whether it's direct or indirect, uh, that becomes a much more helpful and constructive conversation than if we simply go at the issue of assessment kind of uh, in the abstract. Agree? Jamil? Yeah, I think just to complete what Paul said, I think the general principle is that you move away from summative assessment to formative, and that assessment is, yeah. is less a punitive uh, process and more it becomes part of the learning process giving feedback to the professor giving feedback to the students and, and here again art artificial intelligence right. and uh, big data can uh, can be used uh, in, a, in a very effective way yeah. uh, Susanna yes just uh, maybe to come in on this we developed a paper in collaboration you know as part of the mitigating educational disadvantage group with academics and experts, practitioners and learners, and we have some key recommendations around assessment. Um, and some of them was, you know, to be realistic and consider that not all students will be able to engage in um, online assessment, obviously with broadband connectivity and looking at alternative methods of assessment. I know that can be very challenging. There needs to be a focus shift uh, to broad learning outcomes and formative assessment practices as required and a flexible approach to assessment deadlines and timeframes so there's no penalty for learners who need to repeat or have health issues and ensure that learners are equipped with the tools necessary for assessment and have the materials to do so. But one of the aspects particularly around practical assessment is that in the return to campus provision has been made that some learners can go back if they have to for the assessment process where there is no a feasible way to do the practical aspect of an exam online so they can go into the learning environment and the gover government uh, in line with public health recommendations have enabled that to happen so people could complete their courses. So we, we have a paper of just of our own initial thinking on that um, that might be helpful as well but our main focus again was educationally disadvantaged learners and particularly those with a disability 
and having time-bound assessments can be very challenging for people with a disability as well. So I'm happy to share that paper, but we had some thinking on that based on a variety of stakeholders' input I can share. Well, thank you very much for sharing this uh, brilliant experience. And I think that also linked with the assessment, the, the, the key that we have to think about, well, and in online assessment, things all change. I mean, we have to think about integrity. The first thing that comes into mind, like, yes, support is support, but then we have to also think about integrity in a new way, authentication of a student when it comes to the assessment. So all there are so many issues linked to the online assessment that it makes like um, a whole new uh, area of, uh, you know, study and a whole new area to explore, uh, basically. Um, and the final question I think that we take and then we close on this, we talked about the governance, we talked about teaching and learning and assessment. I think that the other aspect pillar of higher education is research and there is a question here raised about the research projects. And a concern being widely faced by teachers and scholars in this pandemic situation pertains to research projects that are essentially required for degree completion. And so. What are your views about the challenges and how to uh, face those challenges when it comes to research and when it comes to uh, work in the lab? I mean, all the things that uh, all the actions and activities that cannot be done online or um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the research project that you are leading, how not to jeopardize them, the quality of those research projects amid the pandemic? Who wants to respond to this one? I just have Jamil, uh, uh, well, I think that for, for many, many students, the field needs to do continue their interviews, their research, their experiments. That will be really a tragedy because they, you know, they are, they are, they, it's on hold for many months and maybe longer. And I think that's again where the flexibility from their supervisors have to come in and we should penalize and find a way to uh, assess for their progress and, 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 and support them. But now there we, we can also be very innovative and there are many disciplines where the uh, use of uh, electronic labs, digital labs and uh, can be, can be considered, and I, I mean, uh, as I said, it would be very discipline specific. But uh, you know, medical simulations have already been uh, around for many years in engineering, in electronics. You you have many ways to. If you have an internet connection, then you can access labs that are remote. And I think that what we are seeing during this pandemic is really a surge in generosity and solidarity among scholars, universities in the south, 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 north, etc. And I think we that there are many opportunities that we we have to explore. Some universities have been already working on them and they have to share with other universities to make sure that researchers are not unduly penalized by the pandemic. Yeah, I think the phrase, uh, Jamil's phrase, discipline specific is really the critical one here because uh, you know, I'm writing a book on educational credentials currently, and I could hardly have a better environment uh, for conducting that research. But I'm worried about those fields in which really the model is one of apprenticeship. And it's very difficult to imagine that the values of, of intensive mentorship can be accomplished by means other than people being together and working together on, on problems. So. I think this does have to be addressed to a large extent, uh, discipline by discipline, but uh, making sure that the playing field is is level for, for all students, regardless of their discipline, I think has to be a priority. Thank you very much. And before we close, I just want to thank you for your expert moderation of this discussion this morning. Well, thank you very much, thank you. And <laughs> thank you very much for this Great contribution, invaluable contribution indeed. Neve, do you want to say something regarding the research aspect? As a, just to say a small point, it is discipline by discipline and 
protocols have been put in place to identify you know, what subject, what students need to go into the lab. And it has been made possible in line with the social distancing. In our own organization, we carry out a lot of research and it is all online and our focus groups on, are online. So I think it's drawing on the innovation, maintaining robust methodology, um, drawing on experts. We're talking about a lot of collegial support and generosity and people have been trying to support each other about how you can maintain your research projects. But um, currently in terms of the research, it was looking at who needs to go back in and supporting those students to be able to get back onto campus. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this has been a very valuable drop into the overall bucket of all the beautiful ideas we had and beautiful responses we had. I would like to uh, just conclude by saying that, well, I think that this discussion has been really invaluable and productive. And regardless of COVID, regardless of all the, you know, um, the a difficult situation we are in, we still acknowledge that there are so many other things to be explored, so many other, so many opportunities for being creative and for coming up with these solutions to all these issues that are outstanding here. And it's the right time to rethink quality and the, and the definition of quality. This has to be definitely revamped, reimagined to make it more relevant to the current developments to address the diversity and to address the trust and relevance in the provisions, regardless of the mode, regardless of the situation. And most importantly, we have to already be thinking about the um, business sustainability. I mean, how do we make our businesses sustainable? I mean, the pandemic in, in the face of uncertainty and how to tackle all the um, unpredictable situations we find that in. So we have to be ready for that. Thank you very much. I would like to thank all the participants for their active participation, beautiful questions, for the invaluable contribution of the panel members, and for the beautiful support we received from the DAC, Leah and Rob. Thank you very much, everybody, and we look forward to welcoming you in other um, the webinar on the 14th and also in Moscow end of September during our workshops and during our forum for for 2020. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.